Well, thank you for that kind introduction and the opportunity to, to share this time in the morning with you. Um, so, I was going to talk about prostate cancer today, and one of the things they wanted me to address is, first off, why is prostate cancer so common? And I'm sure all of you have either had family members or perhaps even a direct experience with prostate cancer and may have asked yourself this at one time or another. And the first thing I think we have to look at is cancer in it and of itself is a common problem. Um, in the United States, one in two men will eventually be diagnosed with uh, some form of cancer over the course of their lifetime. And cancer has actually been catching up with heart disease as the number one cause of mortality in the United States. And I think a lot of this is due to better health care, better you know, reduction in cardiac risk with all the procedures they can do now, leading to more men eventually developing cancer. And as you can see, amongst men who do get cancer, prostate is the most common. And so this is another picture just showing both for men and women what are the most common types of cancer. And prostate cancer in uh, respect to incidence is very similar to breast cancer. About one in six men will get prostate cancer and there are about 250,000 cases a year. Um, interestingly, the next most common are lung, both for men and women, and then colon for both men and women. But if you look at the risk of dying from prostate cancer, actually lung cancer, though less common, has a higher mortality rate, reflecting the uh, more aggressive nature of this disease. So what you can kind of infer from this is while many men do get prostate cancer, dying from it is not as common compared with other types of cancers that we see. So sort of summarizing that, um, again, we, we, exp we see about 250,000 cases a year. But one of the interesting things we see when you break these numbers down is that in African Americans, the incidence of prostate cancer is almost twice as high as in Caucasian patients. And in patients of Asian descent, it's about half as common. And this carries over into the mortality. So African Americans aren't only more likely to get it, but also more likely to die from it compared with Caucasian patients or Asian patients. As we're saying, um, roughly a lifetime risk of about 16%, which translates to about one in six men. And Today, in the modern era with screening with PSA and other tests, most of the men diagnosed are diagnosed with confined disease, meaning disease that hasn't spread to other places. So one thing that we've seen with cancer in the United States that we were talking about is it's overall been slowly increasing over time. And um, this just shows the overall slow increase in cancer. And what you'll see is this interesting kind of jump um, jump right here around the 90s and it's only in men so I think most of you probably have figured it out that there was a steep increase in prostate cancer diagnoses during that time and the reason for that uh, I accidentally flashed up there for you was the start of PSA screening so PSA stands for prostate specific antigen and it's only made by the prostate or prostate cancer and so it became a very good marker for screening men to try and detect this cancer early. And that's what led to this sort of spike in diagnoses in men in the 90s. Now, um, in addition to the screening, you know, there's various risk factors that we look at to try and determine why it's so common and what your risk is of having it. And so probably the biggest risk factor is just getting older. Age is... Um, highly correlated with the risk of prostate cancer. In fact, if, uh, yeah, and that's not something you wanted to prevent or anything. You know? <laughs> um, so, um, but if you, if you did an autopsy on men in their 70s, probably somewhere in the order of 70% would have some grade of prostate cancer present. Race, as we were discussing earlier, African Americans tend to get it more commonly and more aggressively. Nationality, family history and genetics, and diet and obesity have all been associated with this. And as you know, all these kind of interplay with one another, obviously. Um, they're, they're not all independent of one another. And so to address age a little more closely, um, this is some recently published data where they looked at a, ca a Caucasian um, population in the black bars and an Asian population in the white bars. And what they did was they did an autopsy series in men who had died of other causes besides prostate cancer and said, 
in men with no indication that they had a problem with their prostate, how many of them actually had prostate cancer? And if you look at by age, it increases. So by the time you get to the 60s or 70s, it's somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of men who are feeling fine, have no indications on an autopsy series, will have some level of prostate cancer. Uh, the other interesting thing I think you can see from this is it looks like Asians, for whatever reason, develop prostate cancer later. So you can see there is probably a 10 to 20 year shift where Asians don't start to develop prostate cancer until their 50s. And this may be dietary, environmental, genetic, we don't know for sure. But it is an interesting observation that I've made. So uh, going into race, I, I'll kind of address the two extremes. So one of the things they've looked at with Asians is why do they get it less? And so over time, in an Asian population, the bottom dashed line here is prostate cancer, actually has increased over time in Asia. And the question becomes, why is that? Is it the industrialization of these Asian nations uh, exposing them to more carcinogens? Smoking has increased. Um, consumption of beef and other you know, meats has increased. Could any of these be contributing to that? And the answer isn't really clear aside from we know that it goes up. The interesting thing is if you take Asians who move to the United States, their risk level will go up, but not to the level of um, a a Caucasian in America, it will be somewhere between an Asian in Asia and um, a Caucasian in the United States. So there probably is some genetic component there where they still don't go to the same risk level. Um, so the question also becomes, why are African Americans more prone to getting prostate cancer? And for whatever reason, we know that African Americans who are initially diagnosed with a low-risk prostate cancer, if you actually take out their prostate and look at it, more often you will find a more aggressive prostate cancer in there than you would have expected. Um, overall, African Americans tend to present with bigger tumors and more aggressive disease. There appears to be a longer delay between treatment and uh, diagnosis for African Americans. And there is also likely a genetic component. So I. I don't think we have good explanations for all of this, and it's all being investigated right now, but I do think a lot of oncologists look at African Americans at a, as a specific population as, at risk for this that perhaps needs to be followed more closely because of the higher propensity to have aggressive disease. So uh, like we were talking about nationality, um, this kind of takes everything together, genetics, diet, things like that. Um, and you can see that uh, there's much higher burden of disease in the North Americas, um, perhaps partly due to higher life expectancy, partly due to genetics, perhaps partly due to our diet and, and other things like that. Um, and, and you can see um, lower risks through uh, Africa and uh, much of uh, Asia there, perhaps reflecting either, again, um, something related to aging or um, a genetic component. So it's interesting because I get a question all the time, you know, uh, Doc, what can I eat to prevent this? And you hear about things like capsaicin, uh, pomegranate juice, green tea. And if you look through the literature, there's a variety of studies that both support and refute these things. And I just thought this was an interesting study. This isn't specific for prostate cancer, but um, they found overall that you live longer if you drink coffee. And, um, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm, I'm doing my part today here. Um, so, um, but, so it, it comes back to, it's very hard oftentimes to find causality in a disease that's very common and exposures that are very common like coffee. And so um, historically, coffee was thought to be a bad thing, but the problem was what happened, those studies didn't take into account smoking and a lot of people who drank coffee smoked. Once you took the smoking out of the equation, it looked like coffee actually was a benefit to your health. Interestingly, I was able to come up with a few papers that showed that coffee reduces your risk of prostate cancer. I'm not sick. Yeah, the, they think, is it better vigilance with the caffeine? Is it the flavonoids or antioxidants in the coffee? And so there's a lot of theories as to why this might work, but um, I don't think anyone knows for sure. 
but it is an interesting observation. Now, I'm not recommending this as something that you go out and drink uh, five cups of coffee every day to prevent prostate cancer, but there are a lot of studies out there that are looking at various things in your environment that may contribute to prostate cancer. Now, in my opinion, I think probably the biggest concern I have about exposures is testosterone. And I'm sure you've all seen those football, during the football games, they have those low T commercials where they say, are you feeling tired? Have you had your T number checked and things like that? Um, well, I think a real concern among the oncology community is what does testosterone supplementation do? Now, up to this point, there haven't been any conclusive studies that has shown testosterone supplementation will actually increase your risk of prostate cancer. But many oncologists have been through this before with women who had estrogen supplementation and an increased risk of breast cancer. And I think in the back of all of our minds, we wonder if enough men get testosterone supplementation, may we see a spike or more aggressive prostate cancers coming up. The jury's still out on that, but I think it, amongst exposures, that is probably the one that con concerns me the most. Um, so many of you have, may have also read in the papers, the screening recommendations have come under fire for prostate cancer. Should men get screened? And so the United States Preventative Task Force was the same group that released the changes in mammography guidelines a few years back. They recommended that prostate cancer not be screened for anymore. And they felt that basically the side effects associated with treatment were outweighed, you know, um, the, they, they were too great to treat, and so it's better just not to get screened. The American Urologic Association said that they think it should be a personal choice. Like we were saying, depending on your age, your family history, and your, your race, you may choose to get screened because you're at higher risk. Um, the American Cancer Society has their own set of guidelines. They, again, do not think it should be routine, but they recommend that you discuss with your doctor getting screened, and they've broken it up by what they feel are good risk groups. So if you're 40 and you have many male relatives with prostate cancer, you should probably get screened at that age. If you're African-American or have one first-degree relative, start at 45. And then at 50, as, as they've made it very clear, offer a PSA or DRE, which is a, a rectal exam to check the prostate, um, but they do not require it. The American College of Physicians has their own set of requirements. Um, they, again, set an age range here for PSA screening, and they say, again, the harms of treatment or diagnosis may outweigh the benefits. And then my, my group, the American Society of Radiation Oncologists, basically feel that that recommendation is kind of a one-size-fit-all, and that given the diversity of men that are in the United States and their various risk factors, that you know, screening should be discussed and at least considered. And so I think what we have to ask ourselves is a uh, question. Yeah, but isn't the reason that all these standards were changed because of a high number of false positives? Yes, and that's our next slide here is basically what is the data that is this based on, you know? And it is based on two studies that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, as you're saying, you know, the number needed to screen was very large to save one life. But if you look at these studies, um, there are some shortcomings that you need to look at. So one was conducted in the United States, and one was conducted in Europe. And what they did was they assigned men to either getting screened with a PSA regularly or the usual standard of care. And what they found is essentially what, what you are alluding to, that Screening didn't really present, prevent prostate cancer deaths uh, in this U.S. study. Now, there are some criticisms of this study, one of them being a lot of men before they entered this study had a PSA. So in a sense, you were already screening the men that were entering the study. Within the three years before this study started, 90% of these men already had a PSA. So if you had cancer at the time, you were screened out of the study. The other thing to look at is in the control group, the men who had usual care, almost half of them had PSAs drawn to check them. And the compliance rate, meaning how many people in the screening arm actually got screened, was about 85%. So you're comparing a group of men where 50% got screened and 85% got screened. And so it's not clear to me that you can say that 
there is no benefit to screening based on this study because the two groups were actually more similar than we would have wanted them to be. The, yes? So it's not the PSA test, it's the treatment that goes with it. So um, that's another imp a good point. I think the screening in and of itself I don't think is a bad thing. It's what we do with that information next. Um, this is the European study, and they had sort of similar things, again, assigning men to being screened versus not, but they did have some longer follow-up. So again, their results were, and this goes back to what you were saying, so of those people who were screened, only about 16% had a positive PSA. Of those who got screened, about 86 got a biopsy, and you can see only 24% of the time did they actually detect a prostate cancer. So there will be a large number of men who actually undergo a PSA, a subset that has what we consider a positive PSA, which in the United States is over four, and then even amongst those, only about 25% will actually have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. So you do need to screen a large number to get here. Now in this study, they did show a reduction in the risk of death if you were in the screening arm. Again, they had some issues with the contamination where not everyone in the screening arm got screened, and some of the people who weren't supposed to get screened did. But at the end of the day, what they found is you need to screen about 1,500 men to prevent one death and you need to treat about 50 men to prevent one prostate cancer death in this study. And as a follow-up to this, they found that most men did feel like their treatment led to significant changes in their urinary or, or sexual function. And so there was an impact on quality of life. And so this is what the recommendations are based on. Um, that being said, the American Cancer Society has been monitoring um, uh, prostate cancer mortality over time. And the kind of grayish line down here is, is uh, prostate cancer. And you can see starting in the 90s or so, there's been this drop. So screening overall has re reduced mortality, but the question is, with the number that we need to treat, is that a good trade-off for men? And so my conclusions from screening is, a large, like we were alluding to, a large number of men in their 70s will have a prostate cancer, but many of them will not go on to affect them uh, as far as longevity or symptomatically. But risk varies based on race, family history, um, other things. So does one sort of fit-all guideline really work for all men? Um, and, and like uh, you were asking in the front row there, that you know, I don't think the problem is with screening, it's what we do with that information. There are prostate cancers that don't need to be treated. And so uh, the bottom line is we know we are getting these prostate cancer diagnoses. We are probably over-treating some men because the disease will never get to the point where it affects them, but how can we best figure this out? And so um, just going back to how, how most men present, nowadays it tends to be based on a PSA. Historically, it used to be that the cancer got further, further, uh, far enough along that people actually developed symptoms, like it had already spread to bone or, or caused so many uh, symptoms with bowel movements or urination that the man came in to get evaluated. With PSA screening, most men come in completely asymptomatic with no problems, and the mortality rate has improved dramatically because of this. Um, when you go to your primary care doctor, and if you do elect to get screened, it's typically with the PSA, which is a blood test, and a digital rectal exam to palpate the prostate and see if there's any lumps there. Should there be concerning findings on either of these tests, they usually order an ultrasound-guided biopsy performed by a urologist. Um, and if they do find a cancer that looks more aggressive, they may order other imaging studies like a CT or a bone scan. Um, this picture just illustrates what they do on a digital rectal exam and explains some of the limitations of it. So when your doctor goes in and palpates the prostate, it's really only the back of the prostate called the peripheral zone. And luckily in most men, that's where the prostate cancer will come up. But 
that first uh, few slides I showed you in African Americans, this sometimes may not be the place it comes up. So it's just something to keep in mind as a limitation on the rectal exam. But what your doctor is looking for is firmness or nodules in the prostate that could suggest there's a prostate cancer there. Um, now, people ask this a lot too, you know, what, what stage am I? And, you know, in a lot of other types of cancers, like lung cancer, we very commonly say you have stage one, two, three, or four. They do have a staging system for that with prostate cancer, but we actually more commonly use a different staging system. So I just put this up here so you can hear about um, the, the kind of traditional staging system, but we, we do break it up a little differently. And basically, um, the T stage is how aggressive the actual prostate portion of the disease is. If you're a T1, that basically means your doctor can't find anything abnormal on your prostate on exam. A T2 means that there's a lump there, and depending on the size of the lump, they'll, they'll break it down by A, B, and C. T3 means it's punched out of the prostate into some surrounding areas, but isn't actually involving things like the rectum or the bladder. And T4, which we less commonly see now because of screening, is um, invasion into the rectum or the bladder or other adjacent areas. Um, we do check for lymph nodes, particularly in more aggressive cancers, and that's the purpose of the CT. And then a bone scan is used to check for spread to the bones. And it's because prostate cancers, if they're going to spread, it's usually lymph nodes or bones that you're going to see it go to. And that's why they're part of the screening process. So this is, um, uh, it didn't show up, but basically um, they, they break that into stage one through four. But like I was saying, we don't really actually use that very much. And I'll, I'll talk about the grouping that we usually use. Now, the most important thing about prostate cancer when they're talking about prognosis is the Gleason score. Dr. Gleason was a Euro, uh, actually a pathologist at the VA who about 30 or 40 years ago looked through his pathology slides and said, can I look at how bad these cells look under a microscope and predict how people are going to do with prostate cancer? And he found he could. Basically, the prostate has glandular tissue in it, which are these little circles where the one is. And as those glands get more and more abnormal, as you can see going from two to five, the more aggressive it is. And so when you have a prostate biopsy, what they'll tell you is two Gleason grades. And what that is, is the most common and the second most common they, thing they see. So if you see these two slides on the bottom, if they saw mostly Gleason three, and then a little tiny bit of that Gleason 4 on your biopsy, they call it 3 plus 4. If they saw the opposite, where most of it was 4 and a little bit of it was 3, they would call it 4 plus 3. That actually, while it sounds like a subtle difference, does make a difference in prognosis. And so that's something we look at very closely. And this is just uh, the original data by Gleason where he showed as you get a higher Gleason score, your chances of being cured get worse. Now you can see this is from 1974. So a lot of these numbers have gotten better. But this is his data from 1974. So this is how we usually break up prostate cancer. Rather than calling it stage one through four, we use um, the D'Amico risk grouping. D'Amico is actually a radiation oncologist who found that you could break this up by low, intermediate, and high risk. And this dictated how likely we were, would be to cure you and how aggressive we need to be with your treatments. And so um, the most important thing is with the Gleason score to have six or less, be, and that, that means you, you could have the lowest kind of easiest to treat prostate cancer. Seven is in the middle, and then if your score was eight, nine, or 10, that means that we have to be more aggressive with the disease. And um, so that brings us to the treatment options. So this is, if you go on the internet and search, there's going to be a lot more. These, I'm just kind of trying to hit the most uh, tried and true treatment options for you. Um, low risk prostate cancer, um, there's external beam radiation, which is daily treatments. Brachytherapy, which is a radioactive implant. Radical prostatectomy, which is just removal of the prostate, and nowadays I think mostly done robotically, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then there's active surveillance or watchful waiting, which we'll get into a little more detail as well. I think this is becoming a much more popular option among men. Like we were saying, high-risk 
Prostate cancer requires uh, more aggressive treatment. So when we use radiation, we typically combine it with hormone therapy, which I'll talk about just a little bit. Surgery is still an option. And then if you fall into that Gleason 7 category, it gets a little more complicated because, again, if you, if you are a 3 plus 4 versus a 4 plus 3, it does make a difference in the, in the treatment we would offer you. So it does get a little bit more complicated of a discussion there. So let's say you come back and your doctor diagnoses you with a low-risk Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer. Well, what do you do? Well, the analogy we use is it's almost like they've handed you a cat. Uh, well, rather, a, a, a young feline, and you're stuck with the problem of, well, is this over time going to become a cat, or is it going to become a lion? And over time, you don't know which one it's going to be. <laughs> and for some men, it is going to grow up and be that lion. And for some men, even after 10, 15, 20 years, it'll just be a cat who, who isn't going to harm you. <laughs> and. That's the challenge with these low-risk prostate cancers, is we do not have a test out there right now that tells us if you have a cat or a lion growing in there. And so some men say, that doesn't sound good to me. I just want treatment. But we know by doing it kind of that way, we probably are over-treating men, because there are a lot of cats in there that don't need to be taken out. Um, and so that brings us to active surveillance. So active surveillance doesn't mean no treatment. What it means is let's follow you very closely over time and see which way this prostate cancer is going. Is it trying to become that lion and get more aggressive and cause you health problems? Or is it just staying exactly the same and it's not going to get more aggressive? And so this is typically recommended for men who have very early prostate cancers or older men who still have relatively low prostate cancers. And what it usually entails is getting a PSA every three to six months and getting a repeat biopsy every year. And by getting more data each year like that, we can try and determine which way the prostate cancer is going. And what they found is there isn't much risk in taking this option. That usually, if you are followed very closely with these repeat PSAs and biopsies, that we can catch it before it gets too far along and that we couldn't treat it. So what, what is the advantage of this surveillance technique is that Generally speaking, there's less side effects. You don't have to undergo a surgery. You don't have to undergo radiation treatments. We're just doing biopsies and checking PSAs. The disadvantages are probably there's a small risk that the prostate cancer will become more advanced and certain treatment options may not be available anymore because the disease has gotten a little more advanced. There's probably a very, very small risk of it getting to the point where it's incurable. But again, based on the study, that risk is, is incredibly small. Some men don't like the idea of having repeat biopsies, and uh, many men who, who have had them at some point will stop simply because of the biopsies. It's, it's, uh, they just don't want to have that done every year. And then some men, they choose not to do this simply because of anxiety. They say, I know it's there. I know you're telling me it's slow growing, but I just want it out. I don't want to think about this anymore. And so I think those are the hard parts about doing active surveillance. External beam radiation comes in many flavors. Um, the, these are some terms you might find on the internet. Um, the most common one is that second option. It stands for Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, or IMRT. And I think that's the one that's most commonly used today. You may see a lot of advertisements for proton therapy out there. Um, we'll go into that briefly about as far as the pros and cons there. Um, just some words on external beam radiation. If you do choose to have external beam radiation, uh, I think big advantage is you don't need any anesthesia or anything. It's a, it's a day procedure. You just come in for about an hour, get treatment, and go home. Monday through Friday, it takes about an hour a day. Um, I think it's very well tolerated. Even uh, in, in older men who, who uh, may have some health issues generally can get through external beam radiation pretty well. Most of the side effects that occur during treatment are fatigue, some urinary symptoms like more frequent or urgent urination, some loose stools or diarrhea, and most of those go away in about four to six weeks. There are some long-term side effects. Um, there's um, about a 5% risk of having some blood in your stools, almost like hemorrhoids. It's not something that generally affects the health very much. Some, some blockage of the urine flow can sometimes happen. That's about 5% of the time again. 
the hip bones can get a little weaker from the radiation over time, so arthritis or a hip replacement may be a little more likely. And you can get another tumor from radiation treatment. Now, the risk of that is very small, but um, it can happen typically 10 to 15 years after the treatment's been done. Um, and then with any of the treatments I'm describing to you today, um, sexual dysfunction is another, another potential side effect of all these treatments. So this is just a picture of the machine and kind of what it does. It basically rotates around you and, and delivers the radiation very specifically to the prostate. And this is just an example of what we do in our uh, clinic as far as planning. And the prostate's in the red right there and the bladder's in front of it and the rectum's behind it. And so we've shaped the dose so that we're really honing in on the prostate and avoiding the rectum and bladder. And really IMRT, the modern technique, has been widely used probably the last five to 10 years. So I think the side effects from radiation have gotten a lot better than you might have seen in someone you might have known gotten treated 20 years ago or something like that. Another option is something called brachytherapy. And we actually do this in conjunction with our urologist colleagues. And what it does is you get taken to the operating room and using an ultrasound, we find the prostate and put something like 15 to 20 needles into the prostate. And using those needles, we drop somewhere between 50 to 100 radioactive seeds into the prostate. And the chief advantage here, I think, is um, you know, it's a one-day procedure. Now, not all men are candidates for this. You have to have a lower-risk prostate cancer. Because we're putting all these needles and seeds into the prostate, we generally don't like to do this in men who have a lot of urinary problems to start with. So if you have a weak stream already, or already have problems getting your bladder empty all the way, this probably isn't the best choice for you because we would make those symptoms worse. Um, the prostate can only be a certain size, and so we have to do a sizing study to make sure we know exactly how big the prostate is. And part of that is because the bones in your pelvis can get in the way, and we don't want to figure that out in the operating room. We want to figure that out ahead of time. So the advantages are it's a one-time procedure, you still have to go to the operating room and have anesthesia, but no incisions, just the use of uh, uh, needles for that. Some may argue that there's slightly less risk of erectile dysfunction with brachytherapy. I think the side effects we're concerned about, again, making the blockage when you go to the bathroom a little worse, small risk of rectal bleeding. Sometimes the seeds can come out in the urine or get sucked into the bloodstream and sometimes end up in the lungs. It's not thought to be any kind of problem aside from making the chest x-ray look a little different. Um, and you are radioactive after the treatment. So for the first two months, we tell you to limit contact with little kids and pregnant women. Because um, so little kids, pregnant women, with the rapidly dividing cells, there is some concern that even a very low dose of radiation put, could put them at risk. But we tell people generally, you know, um, with other adults, it's not, it's not an issue. This is just a few examples of proton therapy. This is heavily marketed out there as uh, you know, a better way to deliver radiation. There's probably only about 10 facilities that are actively uh, doing this right now, but there are dozens in the making right now. Um, and their argument is um, you can control the radiation dose a little bit better and perhaps prevent some of these side effects we were talking about. And its greatest use is probably in the pediatric population, which these are actually pictures from a pediatric patient. Um, and so when they do these studies, they seem to show basically what you're looking for is, you know, the top picture, there's more blue, meaning dose we don't necessarily want to go places uh, in the IMRT technique versus the bottom picture, which is the proton technique. Now, they've done some studies to look back and see, well, is it true? Do the men who get protons have less bowel symptoms, less urinary symptoms, and uh, overall less side effects? And thus far, they have not been able to show that. So I think while it looks attractive, um, the studies have not yet validated that this is a better technique uh, as far as treatment. Surgery. Um, so. Open prostatectomy is what has probably been done most widely up to about five to 10 years ago. This is the traditional surgery you think of where someone makes an incision basically above your pubic bone, goes in, and, and with their hands removes the prostate. Probably uh, 15 to 20 years ago, they started doing some laparoscopic procedures to take out the prostate. Uh, and for, 
for those of you who aren't familiar with laparoscopic procedures, basically they make little holes in you, basically, that they can fit small instruments into. And the main advantage here is you don't have to make a big incision, so the recovery time is better. And so what they do is they further refine that by taking those laparoscopic ports and attaching it to a robot. And it was interesting. I actually had a patient ask me, well, is the surgeon in the room when the robot takes out my prostate? <laughs> and it's not that kind of robot. Basically what it does is it, it helps the, the surgeon, but the surgeon sitting here in the corner, you see, not anywhere near the patient, controlling, and, and that top picture there shows, it's almost like a little video game controller that they're using to, to take out the prostate. And um, so again, the main advantage is this look like get you out of the OR faster, you know, um, get you out of the hospital faster, uh, less blood loss, but I don't think um, that it will necessarily improve outcomes, meaning they're not going to get the prostate out any better and be more likely to cure you, but I think you'll recover a lot faster. Um, so another question people often ask is, well, what are men choosing? You know, um, and so this yellow bar here shows the surgery, which is about 44%. Um, radiation altogether ends up being about 40%. That orange bar at the very top is the implant, the brachytherapy. Some men will choose to do the combination of brachytherapy and external beam, which is the 5% in that 2002 column. And then radiation alone is that 20% under there. And then the very bottom part there, the pinks, sort of are um, people who want to be watched or have such advanced cancer that they just want to do hormone treatment. So you can see the majority of men end up choosing radiation in some form or surgery. And sometimes it helps, you know, to kn know what people out there are choosing that you may have heard of. And so active surveillance, there's two that I could find. Dr. Drew, who you may have heard on the radio, was one. I think after a few years, he ultimately decided to have surgery. Sir Ian McKellen, um, if you watch uh, the movies, he, he has been on surveillance. External beam radiation, uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, Warren Buffett, the Berkshire CEO, um, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu, and, um, and uh, oh, why am I slipping on his name? <laughs> Charlton Heston has, has had the external beam radiation. Um, brachytherapy, Rudy Giuliani actually had a combination of brachytherapy and external beam radiation. And surgery, uh, Robert De Niro, Joe Torre, uh, John Kerry, and uh, Colin Powell have all had surgery for their prostate. So that gives you kind of an idea of what uh, some of the celebrities or uh, other famous people have chosen for their treatment. And as you can see, it's, it's quite a variety. So. Um, just a few quick words about intermediate risk prostate cancer. So like we were saying, there's probably the greatest variability in this group. And people may talk to you about surgery, external beam radiation, but we then get into an area where we may add hormones. And I'm just going to say a few quick words on that. Um, brachytherapy, I think, is only used in some few select courses, uh, cases, but that's um, a very long discussion. So we'll, we'll move on. Um, so here is what the breakdown is that makes things more complicated. So uh, this was also done by D'Amico, who came up with the classification system. And he found that in reality, those people with the intermediate di di risk disease probably aren't really one group of patients. Really, the 3 plus 4 and the 4 plus 3 behave quite differently, and you can't approach them the same way. And I think this is why there's such variability in how we approach intermediate risk prostate cancer. A few word on hormones. So it's been well known that um, castration has an effect on prostate cancer size and also controlling prostate cancer. So historically, uh, we don't do this uh, at least frequently anymore, is treatment for advanced prostate cancer was castration. And by cutting off a man's testosterone supply, you could cause the prostate cancer to regress or even disappear at times. But generally speaking, at some time, they'd start growing again. Um, now, there are a lot of side effects associated, as you can imagine, with cutting off a man's testosterone supply. Um, so basically, gentlemen, it's everything your significant other may have complained about through the change. And if you ever get put on hormones, they won't have any sympathy for you. <laughs> Uh, so, 
hot flashes, night sweats, uh, weight gain, decreased libido and potency, gynecomastia, which is development of breast tissue. Um, some men will say they feel just a little slower. There are some studies that suggest there may be an increased risk of heart disease or diabetes by being on these hormones. And so, just to wrap this up, um, I think one of the main points here is that a lot of men do develop prostate cancer. If you make it to the se your 70s, there's a se it may be as high as 70% of men will have some form of prostate cancer if you were to do an autopsy. Aggressive treatment has helped improve mortality, but there are significant side effects that we just went over associated with any of the treatment choices, and they can have a significant effect on quality of life. We know we are overtreating some men, but how can we better determine which men need treatment and which ones don't? And that, I think, is probably the most active area of research now, is trying to differentiate the men who are going to have the lion and the men who are going to have the cat. And so that's all I have for you. Any questions? Uh. It's about 40-40 in there, yeah, when you add them all up. Yes? Uh, does the medication for uh, large prostate help reduce the uh, risk of cancer? So that's an active area of research. There's medications that... So um, the question was um, some of the medications that are prescribed to kind of shrink the prostate, improve urination and things, can they be used to delay prostate cancer? And the urology groups have looked at that, and it appears that there may be some ability to delay prostate cancer with medications. They're, they're like called finasteride, Avidar. They're basically used for men with BPH, the, the enlarged prostate, where it's not cancer, but it's making it more difficult for you to urinate. It's, it's actually almost like uh, the hormones I talked about, except a lighter form of it. It doesn't have as many of the side effects. But there is a suggestion it may delay prostate cancer um, from progressing. So that, I think, is an area of, of research as well. Yes, back row. This is sort of related. Is there any correlation between an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer? No, I don't think there's been any clear correlation. I think um, one thing that we do get concerned about with a larger prostate is something we call a sampling error. So when you are doing a biopsy, you're only taking about 12 cores out of that prostate. The typical prostate's probably about the size of a walnut, but if in some men it can get as big as, you know, uh, probably something like an orange or something. And if you're sticking a needle in that 12 times, it may not adequately sample a gland of that size to be really confident that we're not finding any prostate cancer in there. So in some of those cases, they'll actually do something called a saturation biopsy, where they take what, a good number more cores than the 12 they normally would. But because of the discomfort associated with that, that usually needs to be done in the operating room under anesthesia. Uh, I have only one, one comment. Yeah. I've been through this, okay? And I sat there with my wife and I sat there with a uh, doctor. Went through all of these things, these possibilities. Yes. That's a great question. I get this uh, a lot. And I think. So I think it, it is a very personal decision, you know. It sure is. Because. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, everyone is at a little different stage in their lives. So some men who are actively working, and, and some men, you know, that's their only way to keep their insurance is to work. They can't do the external beam radiation because they can't come in for nine weeks every day and hope to hold down their job. Other men have, uh, you know, if you have a lot of uh, little grandchildren around, they don't like the idea of, well, for two months if I get the implant, I can't play with, you know, I can't spend a lot of time with my grandkids. I don't like that option. Um, and, and some men say, you know, the risk of anesthesia scares me. I, d I don't want to do that. And, and if there's a risk of incontinence or something from the surgery, I don't want to do that. And so how each man values that is a little different. So it's, it's pretty hard to know uh, what you would pick. You know, it, I think it largely depends on what situation you are at that point in your life. Uh, back row. So 
So that's a great question. So after the surgery, um, it depends how fast the PSA is going up, and it depends what the surgeon saw when they took the prostate out. So there have been some studies that have shown if the prostate cancer looks very aggressive when they have taken it out, meaning that it's spread out of the prostate or grown into some glands near the prostate called the seminal vesicles, that you should add radiation after the surgery because the risk of it coming back is so high that you can actually potentially improve the survival of men who have had their prostate out with those high-risk features by adding some radiation afterwards. Um, that would also be what you would consider doing if the PSA was rising after a surgery. If you were pretty confident that the source of that PSA was from where the surgeon had cut, it would make sense to try some radiation after that. There are a number of, uh, that's a good question. Um, people will look at free PSA, which is uh, kind of breaking down the type of PSA that they detect to see if you're more or less likely to have prostate cancer versus BPH or something like that that could also elevate your PSA. I don't think any of those have come out to become standard of care yet. There are a number of studies out there trying to look at genetic markers as well. So for breast cancer now, we have something called oncotyping, where they can take the specimen, do specific stains to it, and determine the aggressiveness based on that. And I think a lot of prostate cancer research is trying to determine if we can find genetic markers on that biopsy specimen that will give us similar information that we have in the breast community. So I think it's all being worked on, and I'm hoping soon we'll have something ready for prime time. But as of now, uh, the screening really is uh, PSA. Yes, backwards. Okay, so the question is uh, CyberKnife technology. So CyberKnife is encompassed under a type of radiation called stereotactic radiation. And stereotactic radiation is develop delivering a very large dose of radiation in a very short amount of time. And there has been a lot of interest in this in prostate cancer because you could potentially take a nine-week course of radiation treatment and squeeze it into one week. Um, and so that's very attractive, obviously, for a number of reasons. I think um, amongst radiation oncologists, whether this should become widespread or not is still, the jury is out. Um, at our big national meeting, they were talking about, well, how many patients who have had stereotactic in the literature that's been published have greater than five years of follow-up where we know it's effective? It's about 200 patients. So my feeling is, you know, it's certainly a technique that's at the cutting edge right now. Um, generally, I recommend something a little more tried and true because with five-year follow-up, I get a little worried, well, what if the data really isn't as good further down the road? But I think if you have the type of personality where you don't mind taking a little bit of a leap of faith and saying that's something I want to do, I think it'd be something worth considering. A lot of people are doing it on protocol right now. Yes? <laughs> Yeah, so um, right now, um, I know the laboratories uh, at, in the urology department, this is a big, big thing for them. I, I don't know of any official clinical trial that's open right now, but I know a lot of it is going on behind the scenes, looking at banked specimens that they have and seeing can they predict based on examination of those specimens. And at some point, I'm, I think they will have a study where we can tell you, hey, based on the genetic pattern of your prostate cancer, there's a 20% chance this will become a lion versus someone else where it might be 80%. And I think we will get there at some point. Yes? So it's, so um, uh, the question is, uh, can, can you do anything um, dietarily other ways to not be in that 70% that, that may get the prostate cancer in their 70s? And I think um, it's hard to say. There's, there's um, some suggestion of that, you know, when you look at 
the Asian populations, you know, people have really focused in on green tea and low meat diets, and you know, is that potentially preventing, help prevent prostate cancer and things like that? And it's it's been very hard to determine if that's actually causing it or if it just happens to be that changes in Asia, industrialization, things like that are leading to the higher risk of prostate cancer. So if you search the internet, you can find data both pro and con for almost any diet. And it's hard to really tease that apart. So I think um, exercise, uh, diet, the biggest thing is um, probably just staying healthy, keeping your immune system working, things like that. We do definitely see in people who have immunosuppression for whatever reason, organ transplant, HIV, things like that, that they can have more aggressive prostate cancers. And it's probably because the immune system is not working as well. Yes? So um, I'm not familiar with the flaxseed data. There are a number of studies like that that have come out. The, um, so for a long time, vitamin C, I, I mean uh, calcium and vitamin D were recommended, particularly in hormones, because they can make your bones softer. Now there's some data coming out that's suggesting maybe there's an increased risk of prostate cancer with vitamin D and calcium supplementation. But it's very hard to tease out whether men who had the diagnosis with prostate cancer were taking more vitamin D and calcium, or if it was actually causing it. And I suspect the same thing will probably come out with the flaxseed, is it's, it's difficult oftentimes to separate the two. I mean, um, even something that we take for granted nowadays, like smoking as, well, yeah, that causes lung cancer, I mean, was fiercely debated in you know, the turn of the century as to whether, what, what the culpability of tobacco was in lung cancer. So it can be pretty hard even in something that seems intuitively very connected. It has been a wonderful hour, and we are very grateful. Well, thank, thank you. you.